Hello and welcome to this latest Lowy Institute live event. This is part of what we're calling the Long Distance Lowy Institute, in which we communicate our content and analysis online while we're unable to do so in person. A very warm welcome to everyone joining us from Australia and to those dialing in from overseas. I'm also delighted to welcome a number of our board members to this evening's conversation, including our chairman, Sir Frank Lowy. A warm welcome also to our Lowy Institute corporate members and supporters. My name is Michael Fulilove and I'm the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. And joining me this evening is one of the world's most influential editors, Zanny Minton Beddoes. Zanny has been Editor-in-Chief of The Economist since 2015. Previously, she served as the Business Affairs Editor, the Economics Editor and the Correspondent for Emerging Markets at The Economist. As editor-in-chief of a newspaper whose weekly readership stands at more than 1.6 million and which covers everything from international politics to the art world, Zanny's role requires her to have a truly global view and we'll be tapping into that this evening. Before I go to Zanny, some quick housekeeping. At the bottom of your screens, you'll see a Q&A button where you can submit questions to Zanny. We'll put as many of your questions as we can to her later in the discussion please include the name of your organization or any other affiliation when you send through your question. But first, I have some questions of my own. So welcome, Zanny, and thank you very much for joining us from London. Thank you, good evening. Well, I guess good morning from here. All right. Um, first of all, let me ask you about your origin story, Zanny, how you came to journalism. I'm interested that after you graduated from Oxford and Harvard, but before you joined The Economist, you were a practitioner, you were an advisor to the Polish governor, government and you were an economist at the IMF. So why did you leave that arena to go into journalism? Well, I, when I was at the IMF, I was, um, I was always, the bit that I really loved was going to a country, trying to make sense of what was going on in the economy there. Uh, and I think if I'm truthful, I was probably always better at the writing of the reports than I was at the building of the models. Um, but it was that's, that was the part that I really liked. It was sort of trying to make sense of an economy and then writing that down. And after a while, I mean, the IMF is fantastic. I learned a huge amount, but I realized that probably I wasn't cut out for a sort of, uh, you know, a kind of somewhat bureaucratic organization. And so I decided I wanted to go to journalism. And it was kind of go back to journalism. I'd done quite a lot of student journalism. So it had always been something I liked to do. Uh, and then I thought, where's, where can I write about economics? Where's a place that I can you know, do what I love doing, which is uh, trying to understand economies and write about them? And I went to The Economist. And, you know, quarter of a century later, here I am. So you must love The Economist. What do you love about the newspaper? Oh, it's, it's an amazing place. It, it's a, first of all, it's an extraordinary um, platform. And it's, it is a, a wonderful calling card. You can talk to almost anybody you want. It's a, an amazing collection of, of colleagues. I have some of the smartest people in the world who, who could almost all be either more famous or a lot richer if they worked somewhere else, um, but yet they choose to work at The Economist. And we have a wonderful collegiate spirit and we get to think about the most important issues of the moment. And I think we also have, and, and for me, this is really important. It's, a, it's an institution whose who's kind of values and whose who's the cause that we champion, the English liberal cause is one that I you know, profoundly believe in. And, and right now, I think it's a particularly important time to be doing that. So for all of those counts, it's the most amazing job in the world. I love it. Well, let me ask you about liberalism and some of those issues that are surfacing at the moment. The media is in the thick of another big debate about free speech. And since its establishment in 1843, The Economist has always stood for individual and economic freedom. So where do you come down on the current debate? For example, what did you make of the decision by the New York Times uh, a month ago, first of all, to publish that op-ed by Senator Tom Cotton, but then to reverse course and conclude that they had made such a grotesque error that in fact they should remove the two senior editors in the op-ed department and restructure the whole department? What did you make of that discussion and all the discussion about the, the so-called civil war within the New York Times? Well, I found the latter part really quite troubling. I mean, I, you know, there may have been, you know, ways in which that uh, op-ed was handled that I, I like to think I might have handled it differently, but I firmly believe, firmly, firmly believe in the importance of hearing different viewpoints. And I think an op-ed page is a marketplace of ideas. And I'm really troubled by an environment where increasingly, you know, certain views are deemed off limits for debate in the United States in particular. 
And so I'm, I'm very much at the end of the spectrum that thinks that the only way you make progress in a polarized environment is by engaging in debate with people of different persuasion. We're not gonna make progress by having a whole load of like-minded people in an echo chamber. And, and uh, an op-ed page is such a marketplace of ideas. And so I think that it's, if you have an op-ed page where you aren't, you don't hear alternative uh, opinions, and particularly, you know, Senator Tom Cotton, whatever his, you know, whatever you think of his argument, it's one that is important to hear because he is an influential senator. Um, it's not, it's, it's sort of, it's extraordinary to me that one would not want to have that as part of the, the discussion of ideas in the United States right now. Now, you faced similar criticism, I recall, in 2018 when you invited Steve Bannon to appear at a festival The Economist was running, and you proceeded with that interview. But around the same time, David Remnick of The New Yorker withdrew the invitation to Bannon just a few hours after he'd made it. Now we've had the Tom Cotton affair and various other sort of tall trees falling. Do you think you're on the losing side of this argument? Well, I profoundly hope not. I mean, I really, I really genuinely worry about a world where the, it, is not, it is deemed not okay to engage with people of differing viewpoints and to have rational debate. I think that's one of the central tenets of liberalism and it's one of the central tenets of what will allow us to make progress. So I, I don't think I am. I think that there is still a, you know, a profound support for the importance of free speech. Um, but I do worry about you know, a growing intolerance of many, particularly on the left, um, where the, the idea that it's, it's, it's somehow no longer okay to engage in a broad diversity of, of opinion. And for me, the decision to engage with Steve Bannon was actually a, a kind of canonical moment. The, the event that you're talking about was an event to celebrate our 175th anniversary. And it was a discussion, it was a whole day's debate about what 21st century liberalism should look like. And it was one where we felt it was very important to engage with people of a different worldview. And Steve Bannon you know, has a profoundly different worldview than I do than The Economist does. But he was at that point, he just left the White House. He's a very eloquent and, and important sort of proponent of a completely different worldview. And I think rather than you know, having a lot of people with a similar view discussing things, it's incredibly important to engage with that different one. So I was, for me, it was an absolute sort of essential testament to what we were trying to do then. All right, let me stay on the United States. You were based in the US for nearly two decades. What do you make of what's happened to America over the past few years and indeed over the past few months? What's, what's the balance of optimism and pessimism in your mind about the future of a country that you know rather well? Well, it's, it's interesting, and I, I'm kind of asking myself increasingly, how well do I know it? And you're right, I spent most of my adult life in the US, and all the time that I was in the US, it was almost a trope to talk about how polarized America was. There was talk about the polarization of America in the 1990s and the 2000s, but I genuinely think that the country is more sort of polarized and angry than I have ever known it. And not only are there two very, very different kind of camps which, with very different worldviews, they also increasingly live in different environments with sort of different fact bases almost. And I think one of, the, one of the consequences of this whole polarization of the media and the, the re sort of reduction of trust in media and the demonization of the main mainstream media by President Trump uh, is that you have, you have Americans kind of living in different universes. So that really, really worries me. And I think there is, and particularly over the last you know, two, three years, there has an anger has developed there and there's a sort of a sense of anger and frustration. And that's, that's the bit that makes me worried. On the positive side, I actually think, that, you know, the last few weeks have made me, you know, very, in, in some ways, very optimistic about the power for change too. So I think there is a huge amount of energy to really make progress to change things. And the, and the challenge in the US will be to kind of harness that positively. But at the moment, it feels like a an angry, uh, a polarized, and, and a place that's quite worrying and quite on the edge. Let me ask you about COVID, because COVID is, is shaping up as a stress test for nations. And some are doing very poorly, like the United States, and, and I'm afraid to say, I think the United Kingdom. Other countries, smaller, more agile countries with rational politicians and bureaucracies seem to be doing a little bit better. Do you think that the virus will and the pandemic will shake up the global order in, in, in ways? Is it changing 
the way we look at the power and the prestige of, of different countries? Is it reshuffling the order in which we in which we operate? Do you think? I think it is, but let me. I'm going to slightly take issue with your premise because I think there is there are some sort of structural reasons as well as management reasons for how this disease is developed in different countries and countries which have you know global cities, countries which have you know high diabetic populations and all of the things that you know make it harder to deal with or, or make, make, make people more vulnerable to the disease. Countries with different healthcare structures have had different responses. So it's not all uh, the way, you know, the leadership evolves. But that said, you're right. I think the experience of, of, of COVID has shaped people's view, particularly of the United States, um, on two counts, I think. Firstly, that in, in previous pandemics, whether it's Ebola or even before that, you would have expected the United States to be sort of a, a global leader in this. You know, the United States has some of the best epidemiologists, it has the best, some of the sort of best infrastructure for dealing with this. It would ordinarily have been expected to be leading a, a kind of global response. And right now we have the exact opposite. We have the United States at best sort of completely absent and also handling it very badly itself. So I think that's sort of one big change. It's the lack of US leadership and hence the lack of multilateralism. More broadly, you know, people say this is going to change the perspective of, uh, the, of China, China's global role. I'm not so sure about that. I think that there is a lot of, China's clearly handled it, in, it more effectively with an enormously sort of, uh, you know, complete shutdown the way they've managed to do that. But I, I'm not sure that it, it necessarily will turn out to be sort of China's moment in a more broadly global role because of the sort of somewhat heavy handed way in which they're trying to exploit that. I'm not sure to what extent you've watched Australia's uh, approach to China in the past uh, year or so, but our relationship has hardened uh, very substantially. And of course, China is our most important economic partner, but the United States is our great um, security ally. And Australia has found itself pushing back uh, against China in a number of areas on, on foreign interference, excluding Huawei from our 5G network, and in fact, uh, encouraging Hawks in Britain to, to do the same, and now taking the lead in calling for an international investigation into the origins of the coronavirus pandemic. How does that look to you from your editor's office? Does that look like um, a smart response by a democratic middle power? It's about time that, that someone is pushing back or does that look self-defeating? What does it, how does it appear to you from where you sit? I think it's more like a canary in a coal mine, actually. I look to what uh, Australia is doing as a, uh, a sort of harbinger of what many other countries, choices many other countries are facing and, and trade-offs many other countries are gonna to have to deal with. And so I'm, I'm really interested in how the Australian position has evolved. Uh, I, I, for me, you know, the single biggest sort of determinant of the next few decades is going to be the relationship between the US and China and how China behaves and how the US behaves. And I'm very worried about where that relationship is going. I'm also increasingly clear that Europe is unlikely to play the kind of leadership role that it ought to. And so in a world where the you know, post-war global order is fragmenting, where you have a, you know, a China that is becoming more assertive, even as it is becoming more you know, authoritarian, uh, and it's clearly changed quite substantially as, as you know, you and Australia have been at the forefront of realizing in the last few years. Uh, I think that's, you know, that's the great question of our time. And so I look to Australia, I don't, it's not so much with a judgment as it is with a, with a kind of, you know, a really sort of interested curiosity, because I think the kinds of debates that you're having are the kinds of debates that lots of other countries are going to be having. Mm. The, the only problem with the canary and the coal mine metaphor is the canary doesn't have much agency. And in, in Australia's case, um, it has made a series of decisions that have brought down Chinese sort of censure uh, upon us. I mean, we could have gone along with China on a lot of these things, but we've made a different decision that the government believes is in our interest. Do you think that, do you detect a, a hardening of views? I mean, you mentioned Europe's approach to China. Apart from the United States and Australia, do you detect a hardening of views in other democracies towards China? Do you detect a sense that scales are falling from eyes uh, and whereas countries 
tended to look at, at China previously as a market, a commercial opportunity. They're now starting to see China in a three-dimensional way as a strategic actor and really toughening up their positions. I mean, you're seeing some changes in, in, in the UK government's approach to China, it seems, in the last month or so. Yes, I do. I do see that. And I think it's, you know, I think it's sort of about time. Uh, and I think that, you know, the way China has behaved makes it sort of important that that, you know, falling of scales from eyes, as you say, is taking place. What, what I think historians may look back on and think is the, the sort of tragedy of the past few years is that that recognition really occurred in the US over the last three, four years, very powerfully too. Uh, and it's on a bipartisan basis, you know, the, the, the kind of shift in view of China has happened in, on, uh, across the US foreign policy establishment, I would say. But in some sense, it's an opportunity that the Trump administration has squandered because it would have been possible to have had a much more coordinated multilateral rethink of attitudes to China. But instead, we've had a, a, a trade war and a kind of unilateral approach and not terribly coherent unilateral approach, which has meant that all other countries are kind of making these decisions in the face of uh, spats between the US and China. So, I, you know, this is a huge geostrategic question and we will need to engage with China. So the option of not engaging is, is not there, but engaging with the, the West, if you will, writ large, on a, on a sort of more coordinated footing would be much more effective than what we have right now. Let me ask you, Zanny, about the international economy, because, of course, the US-China relationship, a lot of it is about the, the global economy. Uh, economists are using various um, alphabetic shorthand terms to describe what they think will happen to the international economy after COVID. Is it going to be Z-shaped or V-shaped or U-shaped or W-shaped or or L shape. Do you have a favorite letter, Zanny? What do you think? Yeah, I, I'm trying to think about finding some kind of hieroglyphic, which is basically like a W, which where the, the sort of end is shorter than the beginning. So, you know, there must be some language in that which that, that hieroglyphic exists. But it, I think we are in for a bumpy ride because I don't think, I think this idea that, you know, there's a second, that COVID's over is definitely wrong. And I think even the notion of a second wave is misleading. I think it's going to be much more a sort of whack a mole world where. We have outbreaks that keep coming back. You know, we haven't, it, there is still exponential rise in cases globally. So we are far from getting this under control. And so the optimism you see in financial markets right now, which is an optimism, I think, predicated on the fact that there's a belief there will be a vaccine and we'll have some kind of V-shaped recovery relatively soon. I think that's not likely. I also think that governments are going to have to wind down the scale of stimulus somewhat. So I think we'll have a sort of, you know, a bumpy W. And the reason I think the end is somewhat lower is that, I do think the post-COVID world is not going back straight away to the pre-COVID world. And we had, I, I don't know if you remember, a few weeks ago, we, we put on our cover, we called it the 90% economy. And the 90% economy, which is the, the, the sort of shorthand we used for the post-COVID economy, is one where life goes back to almost normal, but very large numbers of sectors look fundamentally different. And as that restructuring happens, as that Schumpeterian creative destruction happens, we are not suddenly going to have a traditional v shape back to the economy that we knew before. Let me ask you, globalisation has lost a bit of its gloss. Davos man has coronavirus. Um, what do you think <laughs> the pandemic will do to globalisation? Can it survive? How will it change in future? Well, I I mean, the answer, sort of the glib answer is yes, globalization will survive in the sense that we are, um, we are not going to go to a kind of complete world of autarky. But I think the sort of the zenith, the, the, the era of globalization that began kind of in the 1990s with the fall of the Berlin Wall and, you know, all countries moving toward, you know, you might call to the sort of Washington consensus and the focus on free trade, free capital flows, ever greater mobility of people. That world, I think, is over. That world was already hit by the financial crisis. It was hit by the trade war, and it has now been hit by COVID. And I think in, in particular areas, we're going to see a long, a, a very different one. I think travel is going to be, for quite some time, quite different to the way it was even six months ago. More importantly, I think ever more countries are equating, um, you know, resilience with sort of strategic autonomy or even kind of autarky in the worst states, there's a growing view that to be safe, you have to produce things at home, which I think is fundamentally misguided. Um, but there is, you know, both here in my own country, 
uh, and I don't know if this is the case in Australia too, but there's a growing sense that you can't be you know, resilient if you rely on global supply chains. And if you put that together with the, the bifurcation of supply chains that is almost certainly going to happen from this sort of new Cold War where there is a, a in, at least in high tech industries, a countries face a choice between the US or the, the, the Chinese ecosystem. Those things together are all kind of powerful, powerful hits to the globalization that we got used to. So yes, it's going to be a different world, a less globalized world in many ways, but it's not, we're not going to go back to, you know, total autarky, of course, but it is, it is going to, I think it's going to be quite a lot different than people will have expected even a few months ago. One positive data point for you is that uh, last week we put out the Lowy Institute poll, the 2020 version. And although Australians are feeling unsafe, they're feeling negative about the international economy, 70% of Australians still say that globalisation is mostly good for Australia. So at least here, Australians remain positive about free trade and, and engagement with the world. Australia is a beacon of many good things right now. I mean, it is, you know, unfortunately that percentage goes down uh, the closer you get to Europe. I mean, it's, it's and, and, so, and in the US too, you've seen, well, actually the, the most recent polls I saw in the US, it's not as, it's not as dire as you might think. Yeah. But certainly in Europe really worries me right now because there is a growing sort of sense, particularly in the European Union, of the importance of strategic autonomy. And there's a dirigism that is coming back in Europe with leaps and bounds under the sort of guise of we need to, you know, prepare ourselves for, to, for, to sort of safeguard Europe in a, in a kind of, you know, new Cold War mentality. There's also a kind of post-COVID sense that things have to be done at home, but it's leading to classic European style dirigism. Well, can I say that the UK has contributed to that by deciding to exit from Brexit? From from the U, from the EU. I mean, no, um, I think you're right. I think the the European Union without the EU has lost one of its you know free market free trade champions. It's it's yeah. becoming a much more collectivist kind of you know Colbertist kind of place. Let me ask you about Brexit, and let me ask you a little bit about the UK. In January last year, the Economist wrote that Brexit was the mother of all messes. Of course, at that time all the discussion in the UK, all the political discussion in the UK was about Brexit. Now, most of the discussion is about COVID. Do you still think that Brexit will be as bad as you thought last year? Well, I think Brexit has been a huge mess. I think it is, you know, it's easy to forget that it has completely consumed this country, for, you know, since 2016. And it's, it, it has I still believe that we would have been better off staying within the European Union for some of the reasons we've just talked about. Uh, we haven't yet had the consequence. We don't yet know what the future trading relationship is looking like. And it's only because we've been hit by an even more kind of catastrophic shock that Brexit has fallen away completely. Uh, it, you know, when, at the end of the year, whether we will have another shock, it won't be as big as COVID, so people won't particularly notice. But it's, it's, to, com to say that Brexit is not a big deal relative to COVID, I don't think is a sort of ter terribly, uh, terribly, terribly kind of helpful statement because, yeah, no, COVID is a much, much bigger shock. But nonetheless, it still strikes me that, that the, the way Brexit was handled and you know, underlying it, for me, the case for Brexit was a relatively weak one. But even the way it was handled meant that Britain has, has lost a lot of time and is worse off than it would otherwise have been. Let me ask you about the effect on Britain's reputation, first of all of Brexit and then of COVID. I think for a long time, um, a lot of us have, have given the UK establishment, the deep state, credit for competence and a focus on your national interests and an ability to get the mail through. And I think the decision by David Cameron to put Brexit uh, to a vote and then to lose the referendum and then the messiness, uh, at, at, to say the least, of the UK response to COVID has uh, gone a long way towards ruining that reputation. Is that, do you think that's fair? Has something gone wrong uh, in the UK in the last few years? Have, has this, is, is there a chance that the combination of Brexit and COVID has broken something? Well, you, I don't know if you saw, but a couple of weeks ago in the UK, I think we, we only put this on the cover in the UK, but we had a picture of the the Union Jack with COVID shaped holes in it with the title, not Britain's finest hour. So yeah, I completely agree with you. Um, I think they are, there are sort of the two things together have definitely hit Britain's reputation. I think Britain's reputation 
for competence was already taking a hit with the paralysis the country sank into post-referendum. Uh, already then, you know, every time I left the UK, I would have people say to me, I thought you guys were, you know, good at this stuff. You were competent. You were good negotiators. You, and, but now you seem to be sort of caused in this sort of ongoing political paralysis. That was then solved by, by Boris Johnson when he came along, with his, particularly with his resounding victory. But what we've learned, I think, in the last few months is that the qualities that you know, caused the Conservative Party to fall in love with Boris Johnson that make him a, an, a, an incredibly effective campaigner are not the same qualities that you need for a leader, particularly in a pandemic. And detail, yeah. competence, all of that stuff, that's yeah. not Boris Johnson's big suit, strong suit. Uh how do we explain explain to us the Dominic Cummings phenomenon, if you would? I have rarely seen a government and a prime minister or elected head of government take on so much water for a staff member. Usually staff members are expendable. What is it that Dominic Cummings has that means that Boris couldn't throw him over the edge as he has to a number of other people over his career? I think that's what a lot of people in this country are asking themselves. And I think the simple answer is that you know, Dominic Cummings has a clear sort of agenda. He does get things done. And I think Boris Johnson would find it very hard to survive in Downing Street without him, or at least fears he would. Let me ask you about Keir Starmer too, if I can, because that's another note of optimism after the sort of Corbyn-esque uh, disaster, as I would see it, to have a person of sort of professional accomplishment and a person with a bit of a hinterland in that important role of leader, leader of the opposition is, is a positive step for the country, regardless of, of whether he succeeds in that role. Um, but how do you assess uh, Starmer's chances? I mean, Boris has a very strong majority, doesn't he? So he should, all things being equal, he, he, he should be very secure until the next election. Is that right? Yeah, and beyond. The size of the majority is such yeah. that, you know, people after the election were talking about 10 years of Tory government because with an 80 plus seat majority, it's a huge turnaround to, to, to sort of boot the Tories out. That said, I think you're right. Tom, Starmer has had a very good beginning. He is calmly competent, well briefed, you know, all the things that Boris, people now see Boris is not. And so he's the sort of perfect foil right now. And I think you can tell that he's he is rattling the Tories somewhat um, because the, you know he's going up in the polls. There was one I think this week which had him ahead of Johnson. He is, he is um, you know looking he's looking relatively good. But he's also um, you know meaningfully taking steps to sort of you know clear out the worst bits of his party. And so he's definitely he's definitely worth looking at. And he will even if if you know it is a tall order to to to, to unseat the Tories, but. He will, they, they are going to be a meaningful opposition now, Labour. And, and I think the Tories have their own problem right now, which is that, remember, they came in with, you know, the great red vote, right? The, the red wall that went to the Tories. But these mm -hmm. are, as Boris Johnson himself rather astutely said, these are votes that have been lent to the Tories, not votes that the Tories can take for granted. So the Tories have this somewhat kind of odd coalition of their own now between sort of traditionally Labour seats and their, you know, traditional Tory core, and, and straddling that and working out what the policy is beyond slogans of, you know, levelling up uh, is, is a challenge enough. And then if you have a, you know, sort of quietly competent, well-briefed, thoughtful leader of the opposition, that's, that's quite something to cope with. All right, Zanny, let me ask you a couple more questions on the global scene, and then I'm going to go to the audience and give them an opportunity to ask you some questions. Let me ask about another global challenge that has largely fallen off the radar in, 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 over the last year, and that's climate change. Climate change seems less urgent than COVID, but it's probably no less important. Will coronavirus make it easier or, or harder for the world to meaningfully address climate change, do you think? Well, it's a really, really good question. And it's one which we, we pondered a month ago and, and put on the cover, seize the moment, uh, and argued that it could be uh, a, an opportunity to make real progress. And I think you know, the, the sort of crass um, way of looking at it, or the superficial way of looking at it, is that people realized when everybody was locked down, you know, how much cleaner the air was and so forth, and it made people focus on the climate. But the depressing statistics were that even with most of the world locked down, it was, I think, something like a 10% cut in emissions uh, that is likely in 2020. And so you see also the enormity of the challenge. But I think there are a few reasons for 
believing that if there was a political will to do it, actually COVID provides a, a sort of powerful opportunity. One is that you know when you've got oil prices relatively low is a perfect time to introduce a carbon tax, which I know is controversial in some places, but I think uh, and we've long argued is absolutely an essential part of uh, the, the climate change infrastructure. The second is when you've got this enormous intervention in the economy that you've had across the advanced world, and you've also got the huge restructuring that's going to come from what we've called the 90% economy, but from the post-COVID world, it's actually a very good time for the biggest carbon emitting industries to restructure. And if you can create the right kind of incentives and frameworks, you can actually put in place some of the you know, green infrastructure, some of the frameworks that you need to really make dramatic progress. So I, it could be a huge opportunity. Um, will it be taken? I think that depends a little bit on what happens, a lot on what happens in the US and a bit on what, whether the rest of the world can galvanize around it. And right now, you know, if I look at the lack of multilateralism on everything, it, it would make you feel somewhat depressed. But I'm, I'm quietly, quietly optimistic that it is going to be, uh, we are going to make more progress on climate more quickly than many now think. Another reason for optimism might be that governments are listening to experts again, but also that um, the rest of us seem to be quite happy in modifying our, our lives very substantially in response to that expert advice. I mean, I was, the first few weeks were sort of touch and go, but after that, I was amazed at how even in countries like Italy, where you don't normally expect to see populations following all the rules, people saw the threat and they responded to it and they did as they were advised to by their governments and by experts. That, that was true. That is true to a point now. The question is whether that will remain true. And I think yeah. it will be interesting to see what countries are able to sustain public support for the kinds of lockdowns, whether they're localized lockdowns or others that will be needed in any kind of second wave or further outbreaks, and there will be further outbreaks. Mm. And I suspect that countries that are perceived to have handled it well will have continue to have high levels of public faith in their government's competence, and that will happen. Countries which are not, and I think particularly, I look to the US right now, whether, mm. whether there will be public support for the kinds of things that will be needed. And I suspect we're gonna have a sort of, a world where different countries are in different equilibria. And unfortunately, those which have sort of squandered this first wave to build up public support for what they're doing are going to find it a lot tougher going forward. Now, all these things require leadership, action on climate change and COVID require leadership. And a lot of people have observed that the quality of lead international leadership at the moment seems to be relatively poor. Uh, certainly, um, we haven't seen the same sort of multilateral response to COVID that we did to the global financial crisis. It's hard to work out where the geopolitical center of gravity is. Obviously, we can't look to the leader of the free world because he doesn't believe in the free world. He doesn't want to lead it. But there aren't that many other leaders that uh, that people that 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 we're all able to look to. What do you think about that? How would you assess the COVID class of international leaders? And who has impressed you amongst this class? Well, like you, I think I'm, I'm more disturbed by the lack of leadership than I am impressed by um, sort of, at least at, a, at an overall global level. And I'm, I'm, I think that for, from a global level, really without the US, there's a sort of relative limit to what can be done. I mean, it, it is still indispensable in that sense. So un unless you have, you know, halfway sort of competent, focused international leadership from the US, it's, it's relatively difficult still to get a lot of things done. That said, you know, uh, there are several countries, you know, Taiwan, New Zealand, uh, Germany, that have handled the COVID crisis very well. And, and, you know, you don't need me to tell you what the common denominator is there. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Zanny. I'm going to go to the audience. We have lots of uh, eager beavers who have questions to put to you. So I'm in no particular order. Let me let me throw some at you. First of all, we have a question from Bernice Bachmeyer from the Emanuel Synagogue in Sydney, I assume. And she asks, what do you think are Donald Trump's chances of re-election in November? Well, um, if you look at our election prediction model, and we, we, we launched it a few weeks ago, I think they're now uh, 
the chances of Joe Biden winning are above 80%. Now, I, I look at all of these models with some, some uh, very considerable skepticism. Um, I think our own is the best one, but you know, 2016 is, is certainly something that gives everybody pause. The polls have, have Biden far ahead. I do think that something has changed in the last few months and, and Trump is losing support amongst some of his, not his absolute hardcore, but certainly amongst the elderly, amongst people who have, the people who st have stuck with him thus far. So I think it's quite a hard road from him. So I've, I've, I think now it's, it's probably um, looking, looking a lot tougher than it was pre-COVID. All right. And what do you think a Biden presidency would, would look like, Danny? Well, I think that's going to be one of the biggest questions is what does uh, what does Joe Biden um, end up trying to do? I think Joe Biden has spent his career being at the center of the Democratic Party. And so uh, as the Democratic Party has moved somewhat to the left, so have his policies. But he's basically a back slapping centrist uh, establishment type. He is not a rat. He's not a. He's not a kind of a, a, an ideologically motivated person. He's much more about um, being a decent man who is sort of in the center. So, so I, I think, I mean, if, if I hope that it would be, you know, closer to a sort of uh, a centrist model than anything else. All right. We have a question from Mark McLaughlin, and Mark asks, "What do you think will happen when Angela Merkel steps down? Given that she and Germany have been so..." Uh, critical to the Western Bloc in, in the recent, in the last decade? So that's a really good question because she has completely dominated um, European politics. And, you know, the in, in the last couple of years, there was an expectation that clearly Emmanuel Macron is trying to kind of pick up that role. But the interesting thing, actually, the COVID crisis has been in some ways the sort of, you know, resurgence again of the power of Merkel. And so she will leave a huge vacuum and uh, it will obviously depend on what comes after her. But what worries me is if you look at German politics, it is very, very inwardly focused, very domestic. And none of the sort of the others who would succeed her have as yet, I think, a sense of the kind of the nature and role of German leadership. And, and that's you know, German leadership is integral and, and sort of will define in what ways Europe goes in many ways and what Europe chooses to do is incredibly important in this sort of new Cold War that we face. So it's enormously important and I do worry about that. All right, we have a question from Karan Damija and Karan asks about the failure of populist leaders during the crisis, no doubt thinking of Mr. Trump and, and Mr. Bolsonaro and others. Is this potentially a turning point away from those types of leaders? Yeah, that's a really interesting thought. I've been asking myself that. Is this sort of twilight of the populists? Uh, and maybe, uh, and you know- Sounds like an economist that... cover, Zanny. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it might be. It's sort of, you know, certainly the, you know, competence is being, is being valued again. Experts are being, you know, valued again. We've gone beyond the, you know, we've had enough of experts line. That said, I think this is also, COVID has also been a time when would-be autocrats have rather, you know, successfully grabbed quite a lot of power. Look at Viktor Orban, look at, look at Erdogan. And they have, you know, they are not in nearly as much trouble as Bolsonaro. So I think it's too early to say that, um, but I very much hope that that would be the case. All right, I have a string of questions about The Economist. People are very interested in the newspaper. So here we go. We have a question from Eileen Kwa. Does The Economist have any plans to broaden the diversity of its contributors past its broad spectrum of neoliberal economists? <laughs> well, if you came to uh, an editorial meeting, you would know that, that the, um, you know, my colleagues span a spectrum that goes well beyond neoliberal economists. And we have a, a lot of debate internally, a lot of discussion. Uh, we always, um, I'm, I'm very keen to broaden the diversity of, of uh, economist staff in all ways and I think that intellectual diversity is, in, is immensely important uh, the, the but if if you if if the perception is that we're a you know a whole load of monolithic neoliberals who all believe exactly the same thing that's that's already not true but we do stand for and I'm not at all ashamed about, for that, about this we stand for you know liberal values free markets open societies limited government, the power of reason and, and the reason and de reason debate to lead to progress. And that's 
those are, you know, those are values that I think are as important now as they ever were. And they guide us. The interesting thing and the, the question is how you translate that into 21st century policies. And that's and 20, you know, what, what does that look like in concrete terms in the 21st century? And that's what we grapple with week in, week out. You said a, a second ago that you're interested in diversity and increasing the diversity of The Economist. And I guess the stereotype of The Economist journalist is a posh public school man, perhaps. Um, so to, tell us about that. What 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 is, what is the kind of diversity, what are the different kinds of diversity you'd like to achieve at The Economist? So that, that may be the stereotype, it's already out of date. I mean, I'm you know, a testament to that. We've made quite a lot of progress on gender diversity, on diversity of nationality, on socioeconomic diversity. If you look, the one area we still have more progress to make on is racial diversity. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm the first to acknowledge that, but I do think that and we, are, we have lots of efforts underway to, to make more progress. But I, I'm, I think that diversity is a complicated, multifaceted um, endeavor. And I'm really, for me, the reason for having a diverse group of journalists is that I think you produce better journalism if you fish from a broader pool of journalists and you produce better journalism and you have better analysis if you have a group of people with different perspectives that comes from different intellectual frameworks, different life experiences and so forth. And that for me is the sort of underlying rationale of trying to get a broad group of people. And, and we, we, we actually have that. You'd be, you'd be surprised at the breadth of you know, nationalities that are there, the breadth of viewpoints, but there are certainly areas where we have more to do. All right, we have a question from Flynn Pocock. And Flynn asks, what challenges do, do uh, economist correspondents face reporting on stories from China? Uh, I guess this is in light of the uh, decision by the PRC government to expel a number of um, excellent US correspondents from China in recent months. How, do, how does the economist manage these challenges? So uh, we haven't had any, and as you know, we haven't had any expulsions of journalists. Our journalists have been able to do their to do their work, and we've actually expanded our China coverage in recent years. We created the Chaguan column, we increased the size of the China section, and I've ex increased the number of correspondents in China. So you know, thus far, we've we've been able to do our work. Our website is blocked. Um, they, you know, the Chinese treat us. Um, they they certainly block our stuff. In, within China, but, but our journalists have been able to continue their work, but it's an increasingly, as you know, difficult environment uh, and worrying environment in China. And now there's a lot of question about what, you know, what will the future for journalists be in Hong Kong too? All right, uh, we have a question from Andrew Farron, who reminds us that economist writers don't have bylines. What does that do for their egos and their personal advancement? <laughs> um, it's true. We don't have bylines in The Economist. That was the norm when we were founded in 1843, and we've stuck with it. And we've stuck with it uh, really for two reasons. One is because it, the, because we are you know, a, a views paper, as one of my predecessors put it, rather than a newspaper. You know, we have clear opinions and take clear positions based in, in a sort of an authoritative analysis, fact-based analysis and a fair-minded one, but nonetheless, we do take positions. That's, those positions are the sort of collective positions of The Economist. Um, and having no bylines sort of reinforces that. And it means that everybody is, is sort of working in some sense, you know, as for, for, the, for the paper as a whole, rather than uh, a sort of star system where it's, you know, people, readers might look to one or other correspondent. That said, I think many readers who read closely know, know who writes what, and in an era of, of social media, you know, our, our, our journalists manage to get their own personal uh, profiles really out there, and I think that's great. I have no you know, no objection to that. They have they have social media handles. They have we have now have podcasts and films where it's very clear who's who and, and and clear people's personalities come through, and that's you know that's absolutely fine. And I don't think there's a tension between the two. I think it's it's it, you know we are a collection of individuals, but individuals who work together to produce this collective product called The Economist. I find it an interesting question because at the Institute, we have no house positions and every scholar writes in, in his or her name. So it's quite different. Uh, I mean, you mentioned social media. Do you have to have um, particular social media guidelines to, I mean, would you be comfortable, for example, with one of your correspondents 
um, uh, stating on social media that she disagreed with a position, for example, that the newspaper had taken in her patch? So we do have guidelines and the main guideline is about the mode of discourse. Um, I think it is, I think when journalists are tweeting under their personal handles, they are still affiliated with The Economist. And so the, you know, the sort of standards that you would expect from The Economist in terms of kind of fair mindedness, um, you know, thoughtful discourse are ones that we expect um, correspondents to, to maintain. I think it would be tricky to have a flat out, um, you know, we don't have, I haven't sort of written this down, but I, I think it would be tricky to have a correspondent who said, you know, this piece is complete nonsense written, you know, by, by The Economist. But I believe very firmly in, in free speech and I believe in, you know, people having different viewpoints. And so there are certainly, you know, you can find economist journalists who have expressed viewpoints on their personal Twitter accounts that are not identical uh, to positions that we've taken. But I think the, the, the broader point is that you don't, you know, you don't hurt the reputation of The Economist with what you do. All right, we have a question from an anonymous attendee. What do you think are the key skills needed to work for The Economist? You may, this may be an applicant for, for <laughs> jobs, Annie. What, what are you looking for when you hire economist journalists? Um, curiosity, uh, an ability to uh, kind of make sense of comp something complicated, structure an argument, and of course, the ability to write. Um, if, you, if you don't enjoy writing and communicating, then you're unlikely to, to succeed as a journalist. I'm, I'm a great believer in, in the importance of structuring your writing. I think that clarity of argument uh, is absolutely essential for good journalism. But sort of beyond that, it's, it's curiosity. Curiosity to understand the world, curiosity to make sense of it, curiosity to, to then impart what you've learned and discovered, and a sort of you know, a boundless enthusiasm for finding out more, for trying to make sense of things, and then for explaining them. All right, we have, a, we have a compliment and a question from Mahendra Patel. And Mahendra says, first of all, he says, The Economist is a very readable magazine. And then he asks, who decides the cover story? Is that the editor's fiat or is that something you vote on or how does that work? <laughs> no, we, we don't vote. It is, it is my, in the end, my decision, but it is, I hope, a kind of collaborative effort. Um, uh, but in the end, you know, someone has to decide when there are competing viewpoints. And so that's, that's part of my job. All right. Um, we have a question uh, from another anonymous attendee. What books are you reading at the moment, Zanny? Well, I've, the, the last book I finished was a book that, that is on the Amazon bestseller list and I felt I needed to read because so many people were reading it, which is the White Fragility book, um, uh, which, uh, you know, if you look at the top of the, if you look at the US Amazon bestseller list, it has how to be an anti-racist and white fragility, which, you know, regardless of whether you agree with them, um, I think are important things to have read to understand what is going on in the US at the moment. So that's what I've just finished. All right. Um, let, now this is a, this is another sort of job interview question from Paolo Hook. Um, we're really putting you through your paces, Zanny. He says, where do you where do you see the Economist in ten years' time? in 10 years time, um, I, I, in extremely good hands that won't be mine. Uh, and I hope with, um, you know, serving an, an even bigger uh, group of subscribers to help them make sense of the world in whatever medium they want and what and whatever timescale they want. I think the interesting shifts in The Economist sort of practically are going to be you know, how you consume our analysis and, you know, in 10 years time, who knows, it might all be through podcasts, it might, you know, it might still be some people in print, it might be, then we, that's where there'll be innovations. But I hope we will still be loudly championing uh, economic and social freedom, the English style liberalism in a world that perhaps by then will be a little more friendly to it than it is now. All right, we have a question from Ted Bergel, and he asked, what future role do you see for Japan in the world? a moderating influence on US-China tensions, a positive voice for multi, a positive force for multilateralism, or is it likely to turn inward and shirk leadership in global affairs? It's a really good question. And I think, um, I hope very much the former. I hope very much that it plays a role along with 
other big democracies in shaping the sort of new world order that clearly we are going to build regardless of who is the next US president, the international order that held sway since 1945, the US dominated one, is shifting, has to shift. We're in at worst this new cold war with China. At best, we'll be able to shape some new world order that has, I think, a much greater role played by other democracies than the United States. And I think China, uh, Japan is sort of right up there. So I hope it would be a leader of that. Um, that's my sort of optimistic take. And I think, you know, if you look at the, the role Japan has been playing in the last few years, particularly after the, you know, when, when President Trump pulled the US out of TPP, you know, Japan took the lead in, in sort of mm -hmm. refashioning that. So I think it's perfectly possible that Japan carries on playing that role. And, and that would, I think, be the best outcome. We're, we're going to be in a world where others have to step up to a leadership role. Now, I, I said earlier on, uh, on this call that I thought the US was still indispensable, and I think it is. Um, and I think if the US is completely absent, then it is, it is impossible to build a 21st century multilateralism. But I think even if the US returns to a more constructive role, we are in a world that is different from the one that was so heavily US dominated when we are in the, in the sort of you know, Fukuyama unipolar moment. We've gone beyond that. And so there is a greater responsibility for other democracies, in my view, to um, help build and maintain the framework that will sustain the sort of liberal world order in the 21st century. That's a long answer, but Japan is an important part of that. And on that point, we have a question from Warren Scott. Can the US recover its position of world leadership after Trump? You've partly answered that by saying that we're not going back to the unipolar moment and that other countries need to, need to stand up. But let me put the question a different way. How much of American leadership can snap back um, if, they, if, they, if the Americans elect um, Joe Biden in November? To what extent will the world forgive and forget the Trump aberration? To what extent will they say, right, see, heave a sigh of relief, we're back to normality? Or to what extent do you think there'll be a little part in everybody's brain where we think the United States is less reliable, that's the country that elected somebody like President Trump. So how much can US leadership snap back if they uh, go with Biden in November? So I think there would be very quickly a change in tone. Um, but I think it would be a mistake to think that we are going back to the sort of the pre-Trump world, but actually for slightly different reasons than you think. I think actually the rest of the world would be desperate for that to happen. There's a, whenever I talk to, to you know, European diplomats, there's a, there's a sort of desperate desire to go back to the world that we had before, and to, to, as you say, to kind of hope this was just a sort of four year aberration. But for me, I don't think the US is going to go back to where it was. The, the US has changed in quite fundamental ways. And I think particularly its, its attitude to China, that's a bipartisan shift. Uh, and more broadly, you know, the US, even before Biden, even under Obama, the US was moving away from, you know, the degree of, to which it wanted to, to lead, the degree to which it was willing to intervene in everything. Uh, there had been a shift, that shift is continuing. So the, the United States is not, I think, going to play exactly the role that it did for much of the post-war order. And so it would be a mistake to sort of think that it will come right back to that. But you, you can get a lot from a change in tone. You can get an awful lot from a, a, a change that is one to, to an administration that believes in, in multilateralism. I mean, that, that will shift a lot. But don't conclude from that that, you know, it's, it's all going to go back to the world as it was. We have to build a 21st century world order. All right, we have a question from Paul Rebilliard, who might be an Australian diplomat of that name, I'm not sure. But Paul says, no mention of Russia. Do we forget Mr. Putin at our peril? Um, it's interesting that you say, you know, we haven't, we haven't mentioned Russia at all. Um, Mr. You know, Putin, we would, we would forget Russia at our peril because Russia has an unbelievable power to play a spoiler role. And Russia and Putin has played his cards very, very successfully on an international scale in the, last, in the last few years. So don't forget it. But I don't think Russia, even though it would like to be playing the sort of, you know, be right up there at the very top table, creating the 21st century world order, I'm not sure that it is. I think one thing to watch is what happens between 
Russia and China. That's a really interesting shift. And what, how European attitudes to Russia change. But so, so it's, a, you know, we made a mistake not having, not having mentioned Russia thus far. Uh, but so, and Putin is a wide player, but even though he will, I guess, tomorrow finish the, the, the referendum that, you know, keeps him there, I think he has more trouble domestically than many realize as well. So he's not as strong as he, he he's playing a weak hand remarkably well, rather than someone who's playing a strong hand. All right, we're almost out of time, and I'm going to sneak in a couple more. We have a question from Martin Lynch asking you to weigh in on, on a big issue in Australia. And Martin says that he would appreciate your thoughts on Australia's climate change wars over the last 10 years. How has Australian climate policy looked from uh, The Economist's seat? I think you probably know how I would react to that. I'm a bit perplexed by it. Um, uh, in and I, I sort of I, I wish it hadn't taken the turn it had but I draw a lesson for that for other countries which is you know don't underestimate uh, the importance and Macron I think you know learned this the hard way too with the gilets jaunes you know don't don't underestimate the difficulty of convincing your your audience at home but I, I think that but for me I, I'm I'm confirmedly of the view that we do need to do a lot more on climate change and we need leadership from like-minded countries. And I think Australia has a, has a sort of big role to play in that. And I'm, you know, I wish it had been able to play a bigger role. We have a question from Joanna Buckingham, and this is a very economist type of question, I think. And Joanna says, in the coming multipolar world, what is the future of English as the Latin of inter-country communication? And by Latin, I guess she means lingua franca rather than dead language. That's a really good question. I would predict that it stays. I think, um, and it's interesting, I mean, interestingly, I think the language of the EU is still English, even though Britain is not in the EU. Um, so, you know, my money would be on some form of English, um, still being the lingua franca around the world. All right, I'm going to ask the last question, Zanny, and then we'll let you get onto your busy day at The Economist. Let me ask you about life under lockdown. What have you liked about lockdown? What have you learned during lockdown? So I've liked, I've actually liked being at home. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a huge privilege that we have, those of us who can work from home have that, uh, you know, I get to spend more time with my family, which I'm well enjoying. Um, I'm struck by how relative, how easy it has been to shift the entire operations of The Economist online. Um, you know, we produce everything, films, podcasts, the pa weekly paper, the daily stuff, it's all done online. I spend my entire life uh, on Zoom, kind of much like this, but actually the technology works amazingly well. So that's been been pretty good. What I'm sort of interested by is how we continue going forward, because I think lots of people have had the same reaction I have, which is it's quite it's actually not bad, and in many ways you're more productive working from home. But you do lose something. I think you lose the, you know, the serendipitous encounters in the office. You lose the the sort of building of of social capital that comes from people being together. And I think we, we need to work out how we can maintain that. So we are gonna go back to the office, but we are, we're gonna have a new equilibrium, I think. And that equilibrium, I hope, means that I travel less than I used to and I spend a bit more time at home because I've realized that I can be productive and I really enjoy it. Well, can I say, um, speaking on behalf of many of the faithful readers in Australia, we hope that the, the, the lesson about less travel doesn't apply to travel <laughs> down here because we'd love to see you. You've got many fans down here. Many of us look forward to reading your newspaper each week. I mentioned at the beginning that as the editor-in-chief of The Economist, you have to have a truly global view and you have demonstrated that today. We put so many questions to you um, and you, you probably feel like we've been pelting you with pebbles, but you've done a remarkable job. So thank you and thank you Thank you for speaking to us and thank you also for putting out this uh, great newspaper, which is one of the great institutions of global media and one of the tall trees that we hope uh, remains upright for many years. Well, thank you for having me. I've loved it and I would love to come to Australia. My, I, I hope to do fewer of the you know, trips I do too frequently, but I haven't been to Australia for far too long and I'd love to come. Right, got you. So thank you, Zanny. Thank you, everyone else, for joining us for this latest Lowy Institute live event. Our next live streamed event will be next Wednesday, the 8th of July. It will feature a conversation on the 2020 Lowy Institute poll with the Sydney Morning Herald's Peter Harcher, as well as my colleagues, Natasha Kassam 
and Alex Oliver. Please also keep an eye open for our podcasts, COVIDcast, and my own podcast, The Director's Chair, available on SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Recent episodes of The Director's Chair featured David Miliband and Rory Stewart, probably both favourites of The Economist. And the next episode will feature the Australian Defence Minister, Linda Reynolds. In the meantime, thank you again, Zanny. And from everyone at the Lowy Institute, thank you for joining us today and stay safe and well. Good evening.